There we are. Welcome. Welcome to Sports and Songs, Season 2, Episode 2 tonight. Uh, we're your co-hosts, Andy and Dan. Andy, how are you doing tonight? I'm good. How about you? Good. Doing, doing well. We've got some good music. We've got a little NBA draft. We have college, high school, and pro sports. Yeah. Album review. And uh, we got Thanksgiving coming up. The big Vikings game on Sunday, the late game on Fox. We'll talk about yeah. that as well. But I'll start off. It kind of ties in with this, but I'll start off with the trivia question. Okay. This week's trivia question is what is the only NFL team that does not wear the normal jerseys home and away like the other 29 teams? There's one team that wears them backwards. And I don't mean the jerseys themselves. I'll just wear the white at home, road colors on the road. There's only one team that does that and why. So that'll be our question. That'll be our answer coming up later in the segment. All right. Well, Let's start off with some high school sports. So we got some updates with the with the shutdown. Yeah, you know here uh, Minnesota high school sports. Um, without getting on the political bandwagon. Oh yes. Uh, Comrade Walls made an order. <laughs> this, I mean, Governor Walls made an order this week. Uh, partial lockdown on stuff here, and high school sports is one of the things that were supposed to end Friday at midnight. Well, there was going to be no state tournament this year, no prep bowl for high school football. But these conferences were at least still have conference championships. And they were going to either be this week or next. And a lot of the games were scheduled for Saturday. Well, Walls had it for Friday. It was a lockdown. So a lot of these teams tried to switch games to Friday. And about 95% got them moved. Um, some teams still had to cancel. I never saw reasons why. Like Dan and I talked about earlier in the pre- pre-show meeting, it was probably because there's not enough referees. Yeah. I'm sure some refs were going to do both nights. There just wasn't enough guys. Maybe travel restrictions, maybe whatever. I never saw anything COVID-related. It was just all canceled is all it said. <clears throat> some of those games might have been like the third-place game. They figured, you know what? Our budget shot. We're not sending the bus out there for a third-place game. <laughs> you know? Don't know the reasons. That's what it was. I got uh, a question. Uh, sorry, yeah. Andy. I got a question for the listeners out there. These are conference uh, tournament games, not sections, right? They're not having the state tournament. And normally right. in the state, the winners of the section advance to the state. These are conference. Yep. So for, for the eight, section 8-4A, eight, you know. Um, now, some did make it, some didn't. We've been using Max Prep for our rankings lately. I'm just going to use one for example. In 1A, Mayor Lutheran's been number two for a few weeks here. As you, for those of you following the show know that. Just for kicks and giggles, I checked the Star Tribune website. They had it like at ninth or 10th. Now, Max Prep uses the analytics. They use strength of schedule, everything else. Um, I can't remember the exact conference. I was looking at one. One team on Max Prep was like 13th ranked, and there were one and three. No, 19th ranked was a 6-0 and o team. Because they went strength of schedule and everything else. So, and some of these games, like you say, if you look at their records, why is this 3 0 team on there? Well, maybe they beat three really good teams. I don't know. But this year is an asterisk anyway for sports records. So let's remember that. But um, here's the final, not the final, but most updated one. Next week, we'll have the official final results, standings, and we'll compare Matt's prep to Star Tribune. But for six, all right. At Max Prep, here's one nice thing to do is they do an overall. They combine all of them and you go, here's, your, here's the top ten. So the overall top ten for Minnesota High School football had Ian Prairie at one, Moorhead at two, Lakeville South at three, Recorey Cold Springs at four, Andover, Becker, Caledonia, and rounding out the top ten was Mankato West, Blue Earth, and Rogers. So they – Threw everybody in. Here's your top ten, which I thought was kind of neat to see. We always, we always talk about that. Molly, I got a cat being a problem. Hold on. You want a cat, anybody, for sale? Oh, cheap. Okay, six A. Here we go. Six A. We had Ian Prairie was one. Lakeville South two. St. Michael Elberville three. And coming in fourth was Prior Lake. Five uh, A was Moorhead, Andover, 
and Mankato West. And number six was the Bemidji. Coming in six. 4A, McCrory Cold Springs, Becker, and Hutchinson. Uh, 3A was Albany, Cannon Falls, and Wasika. 2A, Caledonia, Blue Earth, and Barnesville. 1A, Blooming Prairie, Mayor Lutheran at 7 0, and Wabasso, New York Mills coming in at 7. And for 9 man was Hills Beaver Creek at 1, Hancock 2, Renville County West was 3, and 4th was Winnie Mac. Uh, that's the high school part I got for you right now on that. Again, everything else is going to be next week. Um, Again, sorry to get more right on that, but those games were all last night. Today I was uh, had to work what I call the insurance job today, the job I get my insurance through, <laughs> my full-time paying job. So didn't have a lot of time to devote to that. Uh, probably going to do something on Instagram this week, a little more in-depth on all the scores and finals for that. But that's where high school football ended up this year for that. Now, with that said, college sports, some of those are having to make changes now too. As we go through our college info here, we'll see all that. Um, college football, NCAA football. Um, is that it? Here we go. Um, and after, but we'll start with hockey, WCHA hockey. Bemidji State Hockey Weekend was set for the 11th and 12th has been modified. Um, on Monday this week, Bemidji State University Director of Athletics, Tracy Dill, has announced time and date changes for the men's and women's hockey games that were originally scheduled for the weekend of 11th and 12th of December. The games will now be spread out to include four straight days of hockey. The changes will allow the Stanford Center, or Sanford Center, where the games are played there in Bemidji, to be properly sanitized and will eliminate team crossover in player spaces. So the BSU women's hockey team was originally slated to play St. Cloud State University in a pair of Western Collegiate Hockey Association games for the 11th and 12th. The series will now be played beginning at 6.07 on Thursday, the 10th, and the season finale will be 3.07 on Friday, the 11th. The hockey, the men's team against Michigan Tech um, for a non-conference e uh, event will now be the 12th and 13th at 4.07 and 2.07 respectively. That way, instead of men or women and men one day, you know, early in double headers, if you will, for hockey, they're spreading them out over four days. Um, so just check your ticket stubs there. Check uh, with the center, Sanford Center, to confirm everything. Bemidji State's website has it all. Uh, or for those of us who aren't in Bemidji, BeaverRadioNetwork.com will have all the games on there, pretty games. Check all that out. Stay there. I wouldn't be surprised if your local teams like St. Cloud or uh, Mankato or Duluth, the U, if they had special things for opening weekend, doubleheaders like that, they might be changing their schedules. So check your team's website and see what's going on there. Uh, NCAA football, they did make some announcements uh, that there will be 37 bowl games including all four New Year's games. They're still planning on all this right now. Um, everything going on. The Bulls, they are. Um, bowl games that got dropped this year, I know it's going to be kind of hard. Uh, the Bahamas Bowl will not be played this year. The Celebration Bowl in Atlanta, Georgia. The Fenway Bowl in Boston will not be played. The Hawaii Bowl in Honolulu. The Holiday Bowl in San Diego. The Quick Lane Bowl in Detroit and the Red Box Bowl in Santa Clara. Those bowl games have been canceled this year. Um, no offense, those are probably sixth and seventh ranked teams in each conference plan. Travel restrictions, budgets is probably the main reason why they canceled those. Uh, changes the schedule also, NCAA. Go for men's schedule has been out for men's basketball. You don't play everybody in the conference twice. You play most of the teams twice, some teams you don't. Uh, one key game on there, they start November 25th against Green Bay at home. December 4th, North Dakota. I don't know what to go by now. They're still always going to be the Sioux to me. I'm sorry. <laughs> it's going to be hard for you. I don't know. They're the North Dakota something else now. But 
Go to the suit. They'll be down here. Uh, Boston College, Kansas, and St. Louis are the nine Big Ten teams they play. Uh, Big Ten schedule where they only play once. Michigan State they play only once, and that's here at home, so that's a good thing. Wisconsin they only play once, but that's at Wisconsin. Ohio State they play here. Penn State and Indiana we play once at their place, and Northwestern here. Everybody else we play twice. Uh, should be a good year for the Gophers this year. Uh, last year was not. Um, they lose some guys at graduation, obviously. Um, they bring in some good young players coming in, some transfers coming in. Should be a very exciting season for the Gophers, if at all. Gopher women's schedule has not been released yet. Um, but the Gopher women did have some news this week. Uh, since Minnesota head coach Lindsey Whalen ended her career with the Gophers in 2004. No player in the program has worn number 13. She now wants to give someone else a chance to make that their own memories in that number. Fittingly, on Friday the 13th, Whalen offered to put the number back in circulation. Uh, Whalen said, quote, I am honored that my jersey hangs in the rafters at Williams Arena. I am grateful for the impact that you had on my life, she said. Moving forward, however, I'd like to have the number 13 available for others to come to the university to represent the Gophers on the court. None of the six numbers and seven jerseys, Debbie Hunter also wore number 13, have been raised in the Rafters Williams Arena, have ever officially been quote-unquote retired. However, out of respect Whalen, for Whalen and the impact that she has given the program, no player has been given the number for a choice. In addition to Whalen and Hunter's number 13, the other honored jersey numbers in Minnesota belong to Rachel Bannum, number one, Janelle McCarville, her number four, Linda Roberts, number 21, Carol Ann Schulich, number 42, and Linda Cohen, number 44. Um, no word yet if those ladies have ever said, sure, they can wear my number. <laughs> you know, um, I don't think anyone's ever asked them either. I know in pro sports, they're officially retired, but guys have asked, and it's been blessed a few times, but we'll see. Sorry we've got a ton of numbers retired, but you never know. It's nice for Lindsay Dofford out there. Uh, speaking of playoff changes like in football, NCAA basketball, May Madness. Not March Madness, May Madness. Uh, less than two weeks remain until the start of the 2021 season. College basketball, with a spike of COVID-19 cases across the country, has prompted concern of just how feasible a late November start is. And it's, and it's enough for longtime basketball coach Rick Pitino father of our coach, Richard Pitino, who's currently at the helm of Iona, to suggest that NCAA pivots in order to prevent a second con consecutive lost season. So how about some May Madness? In a tweet on Saturday, Pitino called for the start date of college basketball season to be delayed because of the COVID-19. Pitino, in the same tweet, recommended that teams play league schedules only and that the NCAA men's basketball tournament be moved out of March and into May to allow for ample time to complete the regular season. Save the season, Patino wrote. Move the start back, play a league schedule, and have May Madness. Spiking in protocols make it impossible to play right now. Second, the NCAA is considering a bubble-type atmosphere for its 2021 Division I men's basketball tournament. Now, remember last week we talked about how tickets are still on sale at Target Center. still listing them for the Sweet 16. I haven't seen any changes on that yet because this is just stuff getting kicked around. The potential major change would allow March Madness to march on amid the coronavirus pandemic. The NCAA Men's Basketball Committee announced Monday that it had chosen to scrap the traditional – that had it chosen to scrap the traditional plan for 13 first and second weekend sites – Instead, it said in a news release, the committee has decided the championship would be held in a single geographic area to enhance the safety and well-being of the event. And its first choice for that single geographic event is Indiana. NCAA staff are in permanent talks with the state of Indiana, the city of Indianapolis, to potentially host the 68-team tournament around the metropolitan area during the dates of March and April, the committee said. Indianapolis has a long schedule 
has long been scheduled to host the Final Four at Lucas Oil Field, the home of the Indianapolis Colts. The state also boasts Bankers Life Fieldhouse, the home of the Pacers, and arenas and gyms on or near the campus of Notre Dame, Purdue, Indiana, Butler, Indiana State, and other colleges. With fans' attendance in question due to COVID-19, smaller venues could be capable to host first and second round weekend games. Many Indiana high schools have also downsized, have down decently sized, I'm sorry, decently sized gyms. So remember, basketball in Indiana is like hockey is here. Yep. So I'm sure these high school gyms are no offense better than what we got local high school gyms here for basketball. So with that being said, Indianapolis uh, is smack dab in the center of the state. So most locations are drivable. The tournament is still scheduled to go for the 16th. So it looks like they're moving everything to Indiana. Um, I'm kind of happy with it, meaning they're acting now. They're not waiting to February going, what do we do? So they're being proactive. I kind of respect that. Um, so with that said, the preseason polls are out. They are, they are for preseason sports on that. Um, the women's hockey polls are out. Uh, they're there for their sports. I got no problem, again, like I said, with basketball doing that. I like the fact they're doing it early now to get ahead of it, and that's how it's going to be for them, which I'm okay with. We've got some pro sports uh, I've tomorrow. Got, I've yes. got one, one item for college I almost oh, forgot yeah. about. I'm going to be monitoring the UConn Huskies girls basketball, sorry, <laughs> women's basketball this year. You know, Paige uh, Becker's uh, the number one. Uh, recruit in the entire nation came out of Hopkins High School and is playing there. Uh, I'll be watching. They play Quinnipiac in their season opener a week from today, uh, assuming all this happens. But I figure she's going to get a lot of playing time and may even be a, a starter right out of the gate. So I'm going to take that for sports and songs and kind of monitor her progression as her first year. She's going to have a big spotlight on her uh, focus will be on her. UConn is uh, preseason poll number three in women's Are basketball. They? Okay. Yeah. They're number three. Uh, South Carolina won. They got 20, South Carolina got 29 of the 30 first place votes. Stanford second with one. Then UConn is three. So. And then um, did you have anything else for college football? Uh, college football, no. I know the Gophers had a very interesting game last night with a win, controversial calls. Um, but, hey, that's college football for you. Yeah, they did. They did win the uh, the Abraham, Abraham uh, three touchdowns on the ground, and so they looked kind of back to their old self again. Uh, came out, got out of there with a the win. They had an eight point lead going into the final minutes, and then uh, I, gave up a touchdown and won by what three points? Three. I think I read today too. I think Clemson's game got canceled today too. I think so. So the quarterback for Clemson now has missed three straight games, two because of Kate Lawrence. Yep. Because of COVID, this, I know it was kicked around early in the season. He said it was rumored that he said he's going back for his senior year for a chance to win the championship. And then funny, he had the COVID. Uh, some people were saying he was going back for a senior year because he didn't want to go to the Jets. I get that too. Um, but I, I couldn't fault the junior, any junior in college this year going, I'm playing one more year. I've missed three games. My team was chance to win the championship. I got to go back for a senior year. That's what you play college football for. Any college sport is to win the championship. True. Except basketball. Then they just play it. The only reason freshmen play college basketball now is because you can't get drafted out of high school anymore. Yep. That's the only reason they play the freshman year. I, I still love college basketball. Don't get me wrong. But you don't see the four-year starter going draft anymore. But No. <laughs> we'll cover that later. But yeah. Those guys, you can probably count on one hand every year. Um. I do have some playoff pro stuff. Uh, MLS soccer. Oh, really? Minnesota, Minnesota plays tomorrow against Colorado, the four or five seeds. Uh, tomorrow at six here at, uh, in St. Paul. So good luck to the loon that loons there. And we'll get that going. Um, also, pro sports, basketball, we'll go with that. Um, the Toronto Raptors. Toronto being the key word there. We'll be playing their home games this year in Tampa. Um, Canada will not allow them to travel back and forth. 
So sorry, too bad. So they're going to play um, their games at the Emil Arena, which is where the Tampa Bay Lightning hockey team play. Um, after the Canadian federal government ruled Friday that the Raptors will not be able to play games in the country. So that goes on. This has always been a concern due to the travel restrictions that exist because of the COVID-19 pandemic. And the Raptors hoped for, week, hoped for weeks that they would be able to figure something out it didn't involve having to move the entire operation south of the Canadian border. However, the government decided against it, forcing Toronto to have to play the upcoming season in Florida. Now, remember the Toronto Blue Jays played it in their AAA park in Buffalo. Basketball doesn't have that option. Um, hockey, everyone's going to about hockey. Remember the hockey season at the end? They bubbled at two different ends of Canada. So everybody was up there. Basketball is not going to do that. They're going to let you travel. And if we did bubble, someone would be anywhere anyway. I'm surprised the NBA isn't bubbling because of the trouble they had in the playoffs. They were all bubbled in Orlando, and they still had guys coming down with it. So this all being said, yeah, Toronto's going to be playing in Florida, but I wouldn't be surprised if we see more changes the NBA schedule coming up, that being done. Um, baseball. Let's get to what's really important here now. Yes. Mets. We'll, go all, we'll go alphabetically in baseball. We'll start with the Australian Baseball League. Uh, they've revised their schedule for the 2021 season. Uh, games being played 26 out of 31 days. Um, remember we talked last week how with their schedule, they basically played four days on weekends. They're changing all that. Um, a number of the changes have been made because um, some teams are dropping out because of the pandemic. Uh, a number of the changes have been made to accommodate Adele and Brinesman into the six-team schedule after Auckland and the Korean team of Geese Long withdrew from the upcoming season. So they've had to make some changes there. Um some of their conference or league specials matchups, they want to make sure they still have those in line, divisions in line. So that's what they're doing. Um, the six teams and the key stakeholders have in the past week, despite the challenges thrown at us, shown why we are putting the work into play for the fans and for the future of the ABL, capitalizing on the opportunities in front of us, said uh, Val, who's the head of the ABL. Um, they're going to have to tweak their TV schedules, but that doesn't affect us. But just watch it on YouTube like I do. Um, we've taken on Prime Minister Scott Morrison's message that the country will be open by Christmas and we have uh, we already played ball East today. And by pushing some of the content, continent back to New Year, the revised schedule puts us in a stronger position. So you can go to theabl.com.au. If you have a fan of a team you want to follow, got all the information right there. Um, ABL is fun baseball to watch. Manny Ramirez is going to be there this year. Follow them on YouTube. They're good games to watch every now and then on replays. I watch them in the winter. just kind of gets me my baseball fix through. We've mentioned through the Major League Baseball playoffs this year. How many names of these guys came up? There was a handful of guys in there. So it's kind of like watching fun minor league ball. These are good players. It's not company softball built guys. These are pros. Um, so it's good fun baseball to watch. Uh, the KBO, Korean baseball. They are having the Korean series right now. This morning, NC won 3 nothing over Tucson to tie it up at 2-2 in the best of seven series for the championship. Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday are the next three games. Again, check your ESPN app, ESPN Family of Networks for the games. Um, they're all about 2.30 in the morning our time here. So uh, watch it when you get home in the afternoon on delay like I do. Again, Korean baseball, fun to watch again. It's championship baseball, so it's going to be good teams to watch. Good times there to watch that. Major League Baseball. The New York Mets. Breaking news out of the Mets organization this week is second baseman Robinson Cano tested positive for performing enhancer and he'll be suspended for the entire 2021 season. This is the second PED suspension 
costing him a total of $35.7 million. That's more than what most guys make in their career. His two suspensions have cost him that. Um, I know you really can't trade a guy in suspension because who's going to want him, especially with this kind of price tag, but I'm pretty sure when this contract's out, he's going to be done unless he gets some pretty – gets by pretty cheap. Will he appeal that? Probably not. I haven't heard any appeal. He's probably just going to take it. He's lost $35.7 million on it. Pretty sure his contracts are good enough where he's going to be okay for the year sitting out. And he was up for awards at the end of the year. He had a great season. Obviously, he was on PEDs. But new ownership in with the Mets right now and everything else, maybe they might just cut him a check and say, see you, bye. Who knows? Mm. Make an example out of him. I don't know. The Mets did make some changes this week. Keep in court with their minor league baseball affiliates in place of 2021 and beyond. With the only changes beyond the Brooklyn Cyclones, I know a full season affiliate replacing the Columbia Fireflies and the low A Sally League. With Great the move, nickname, the Fireflies. Fireflies. With the move of the Florida State League from high A to the low A League, there is a conflict between the Fireflies and the Mets owned uh, the St. Lucie Mets, which has become the Mets' low A affiliate. Okay. You do not expect this to be a situation um, uh, with their associations. Now, the one thing that Anderson did not address is what we expect to be clarified shortly, is that the Bington Rumble, the Rumble Ponies, <laughs> and the Cyclones appear to be in the affiliation pecking order. There has been taught that the Cyclones would raise to the AA level from the short season to A, and the Rumble Ponies would go from Class AA to High Level A as part of the Mid-Atlantic League. League. Mm. Syracuse, Brooklyn, and St. Lucie are also owned by the Mets. So the Mets right now are kind of getting all their minor league teams, except for you know, St. Lucie down in Florida, are all who have in the New York area. I know we talked about this yesterday, or yesterday, last week, about the St. Saint Paul Saints becoming a Twins Association. Do you have any more information on that, sir? Yeah, here's, here's the update on, on the Saints. And so what they – might do it sounds like a an agreement could be done here by january 1st if they do that uh and that would uh, and that would pull the saint paul saints currently out of the independent league that they're in right now and move them into minor league baseball which is an affiliation of major league baseball and the hope would be to get the twins to be the triple a uh the team for the triple a uh, team for the twins as they no longer have the rochester red wings and so the question Here's the question that they've got. The, it could be, now keep in mind the owners, when the, when the Saints opened up, they put probably a million dollars into the team when they started in 1993 as a franchise startup fee, I think it was about a million dollars. Right now the team's worth about $20 million. And so if the Twins want to, to do that, to buy them out, uh, it wouldn't just be that 20 million price in order to convert into a minor league uh, affiliate team, um, the estimate is at 10 to $20 million additional. And so uh, would they be interested in doing that? The other thing we need to keep in mind is if the Saints are up for sale and the Twins don't buy them, who's to say another team does? And that would be awkward to have another team's farm system in St. Paul. But Nothing can be ruled out yet, but it looks like they may be close to a deal there uh, before January 1st on what they're going to do there. Now, we all know the ownership, the face is, is Mike uh, Vick, Mike Vick. He's 69 years old right now, and the question would be, would he roll into the new team or would he roll off and, and uh, retire? So <coughs> another one to keep in mind there. But, boy, if the Twins did have their AAA team in St. Paul, you have a late uh, AAA call up in September or August, uh, moving guys up and down. There, it's a really a, a twenty. Well, Vec, does he still right does there? Does still tell you the miracle? Vec is part of a minor league team, the Miracle, down in Florida. I believe okay. they're part of the association at one time. That's, um, a, that's the Fort Myers Miracle. Okay, that's yeah. that's the high A team. 
Yeah, that's Vec had his hands on that at one time, his ownership. Um, I know Major League Baseball doesn't want any of the Vec family back in the league. They're still a little bitter about the whole Disco Demolition Night thing. His old man did. Or whatever that was. Yeah, his old man was part of that. So uh, to see Vec at least get Triple A team would be kind of nice as close as we'll get to it, but we'll see. And whatever it's, it's going to be, the, the Saints are typically selling out all their home games anyway. So whoever buys them, it's a wise, it's a wise deal nonetheless. But that's all I've got for, uh, for minor league baseball. Uh, how about NBA stuff? You got anything on the draft? I'll cover a little bit on the draft here. Number one, the draft took place on Wednesday. We had a local, local individual drafted Trey Jones out of Apple Valley, played two years for Duke Blue Devil Devils. Uh, number 40, 41st player taken overall. Second round draft pick. He'll be entering the pros for the San Antonio Spurs. Now, the, the Wolves had their very first ever lottery pick, number one overall. And they picked up Anthony Edwards uh, with their number one pick. He's out of Georgia. Mongoose. He's a Georgia, uh, and just, he was just a freshman, right? So he played one year with Georgia Bulldogs. Now got drafted. He will be good. He'll be fun to watch. We use the next uh, draft further down to give up that draft pick and actually do a trade to bring Ricky Rubio back. To the All the girls are happy. All the girls are happy. And he's 30 years old and aging. But they, the concept here is that I think there's two years on his deal. He could come in and be a reserve backup, but, but also provide that veteran leadership. And it's always been a, a fan favorite here for, uh, for Ricky Rubio. Now, here's the last thing. The Wolves also got, I'm looking here, is it Leandro Balmero? They did get yes. him. He's only 20 years old. He is from, what country is he? Argentina? No, I believe 20? so, yes. So he's, he, we drafted him. We don't have the rights to him until the following year, though, because he's still committed to play in Barcelona uh, for this entire next, next season. And so he's seven foot, six foot seven, um, Leandro Balmaro. So he's out of the equation for the upcoming season anyway. And then we got, I think it was Jaden McDaniels. Jaden McDaniels uh, out of Washington, six foot nine. Uh, Ricky Rubio is back in the mix. Yeah, so not it'll, to, it'll be interesting. Not to pick a scab on Ricky Rubio. I liked Ricky Rubio as a player. But the year we drafted Ricky Rubio, Golden State took Steph Curry with the next pick. That's right. Just 2009, yeah. Yeah. Again, just saying. That's an interesting, um, interesting concept. Now, I've got one other note is that, you know, the Wolves got uh, Rubio. Here is one connection. Let's see here. Here's the connection that could bring these guys all together. It would be the connection on the team, the chemistry, uh, emotion, and relationship. Now, Ricky Rubio lost his mother to cancer. Yep. Brian Saunders lost his father to cancer. Anthony Edwards, our number one pick, lost both his mother and grandmother to cancer. And recently, Carl Anthony Towns lost his mother to COVID-19. So they may have a connection on the emotional side here to get the yep. chemistry going, but that may have been what was going on here behind the scenes uh, with the emotional side. That's usually best in sports like basketball, tight-knit group. Who knows? It could be fun to watch. That's all we've got, got other, for uh, basketball. Other foreign players were drafted coming in. Ricky's been in that boat, so you could help them with that transition too. Yep. All it, right. It may, be, it, may, it may be interesting. You know, who knows? But I'm not a big NBA fan. Uh, it did pique my interest, though, when all these transactions took place. Place, I do admit. Ricky's a good player. He's, he's going to get the assists. He's not going to get the points. Um, he, he's grown up now. Um, we'll see. I, I'm, I don't know if I'm excited Ricky's back. I like him as a player. He's a good player. I got no beef with Ricky. Um, I just have no idea where the Timberwolves are going. I really don't. Um, I'm not saying it was a good or a bad move. Just we were in such a shambles last year. We really don't want – you don't want to blow the whole thing up and start over. We do have some good pieces, but – Let's see what we can do, you know. Um, that's all we have for sports, sir. You're done? 
Yeah, unless I got the uh, answer to the trivia question. Um, yes. Should we do that now or, or wait till Let's later on? Let's do that now before we go to the uh, next segment here. So the answer, here's the question once again. Who's the only team, who's the only team in the NFL who wears their home and away jerseys in the opposite fashion than the other teams normally wear their uh, white teams on the road? It's the Dallas Cowboys. The Dallas Cowboys entered the league in its expansion team in 1960. Team president Tex Schramm decided the team would wear white jerseys at home because he said it'd give the fans a chance to see different colored jerseys of the visiting teams. So Cowboys fans got accustomed to the white jerseys. But what that did, once again, it's making then every time you go on the road, the opposing teams have got to flip around their jerseys. So it's kind of a, kind of a Cowboys thing, but they are the only ones who do that. And they wear their blue jerseys on the road. So this Sunday, the Cowboys will be wearing the blue. They're blues. And the Vikings will be wearing the white. The Vikings play the late game on Fox on Sunday. It was supposed to be the featured game of the week, but with Dallas with two wins, Vikings only with four, uh, the NFL flex that, and they're going to televise for the rest of the nation the Packers game. Our game will be on TV, but just in the Dallas and Minneapolis uh, regions only. But it still should be a good game. So the good thing is we don't have Joe, uh, Joe Buck and Troy Aikman. Then. We do not. We do there. not have the A, the a squad. We get – yeah, so I was excited about that as well. Blessing in disguise. It actually um, is. Something we're doing different this year, this season in the show. Instead of our birthdays and moments in history for sports and music, kind of picking a moment in history or a person in history from that period. Uh, this week, I have an artist of the week whose birthday was this week on November 18th, born 1950. Um, Kind of a, I, I totally picked this name out of the blue. I said, yeah, I'm going to pick this guy for it. Happened his birthday was this week, so I thought, we're going to make that a qualifier. Your birthday has to be this the week of it. The artist this week is Rudy Sarzo. Um, I respect Rudy, Cuban born, American hard rock, heavy metal bassist. I am not going to try to pronounce his full name. It's like most Cuban, Mexican names. I look at it now, I think every letter but the letter Q is involved. Um, it's a long five, six, seven names. I'm just going to respect it and just call Rudy Sar. His first name, Ru Rodolph is his first name, and Sarzo is one of his last names, so it is his real name. Uh, Sarzo remains best known for his work with Quiet Riot, Ozzy Osbourne, and White Snake. And he also played with several well known metal bands, hard rock acts, including Manic Eden, Dio, Blue Oyster Cult, Jeff Tate's Queens Reich. And the, Devies, and the Devil City Angels. He's currently the bass player with the Guess Who. It's not a question. That's the name of the band, the Guess Who. Um, upon arriving in Los Angeles in August of 77, Sarzo happened upon a quiet riot show at the Starwood after being turned away from a sold-out Van Halen show at the nearby Whiskey A Go-Go. He called the show being quite, amb <laughs> quite ambitious for a club band. And after the show he bumped into vocalist Kevin Dubrow, and the two formed a fast friendship. Struggling financially, Sarzo moved to New Jersey in the fall of 77 to join with his brother, Robert, in a top 40 band called A New Taste. While in New Jersey, in the summer of 78, Sarzo received a phone call from Dubrow asking if he'd like to fly to Los Angeles for, to audition for Quiet Riot. He landed in LA the next day, rehearsed with the band, and was offered the job, which he accepted. Though he was pictured on the cover of the band's 78 album, Quiet Riot 2, the bass parts were actually played by Kelly Grahn, the man Sarzo replaced. And that happens a lot in music, so that's not, nothing new there. Shortly after joining Quiet Riot, Sarzo began teaching bass guitar at a music school at the request of bandmate Randy Rhodes. The pair became disillusioned by Quiet Riot's inability to land an American recording contract. Their albums had been released in Japan only at that point. And Rhodes soon left the band after accepting an offer from a new band with ex-Black Sabbath vocalist Ozzy Osbourne. Quiet Riot played a farewell show at the Starwood on October 2nd, 79, after which Rhodes left for England to write songs with Osbourne. With Quiet Riot officially disbanded, Sarzo 
joined the band called Private Army with drummer and longtime friend Frankie Benali. From March 81 to September 82, Sarzo rose to fame as the bassist of Osborne's band, having been recruited by Randy Rhodes' recommendation. His playing can be heard on Ozzy's Speak of the Devil and Tribute Live albums. The liner notes of Osborne's 81 studio album, Diary of a Madman, list Sarzo as the bassist, though Bob Daisley actually played bass on the recordings. Following Rhodes' death in the plane crash in 82, Sarzo became disillusioned with Osborne's heavy drinking and began questioning his future with the band without Rhodes. While still a member of Osborne's band, Sarzo had been helping his former band Quiet Riot by recording Randy Rose's tribute song, his tribute song Thunderbird for their upcoming Metal Health album as a means of coping with his grief. In stark contrast to the chaos surrounding everyday life on the road, with a hard drinking Osborne, the experience was so positive that Sarzo ended up it was so passive that Sarzo ended up recording most of the Metal Health album with his former band. He made the decision to officially rejoin Quiet Riot once Diary of a Madman tour had concluded. Released in March of '83, Mental Health would go on to become a multi platinum international hit, kickstarting the era of widely commercial popularity of heavy metal in the 80s. After Sarzo had left Ozzy's band, a serious rift between the two became primarily a result between Kevin, quite right vocalist Kevin Dubrow's persistent cr criticism of Osborne and the heavy metal press. Months later, when Osborne and Quiet Riot found themselves on the same bill of the 1983 U.S. Festival, Osborne flew in to a drunken rage upon seeing Sarzo, punched him in the face before being hauled away by, by security. Sarzo later reconciled uh, reconciled with Osborne's camp after leaving Quiet Riot in '85. Sarzo, as a member of QR, began to peak, began the peak of the band's success, and appeared in numerous MTV videos, and was voted 1983 top bassist by the readers of Circus Magazine. Sarzo remained with Quiet Riot from September '82 to January '85, when friction between the vocalist and struggle with rival bands in the press convinced him to leave the band. After leaving Quiet Riot, Sarzo farmed Mars with former Ozzy Osbourne bandmate Tony Aldridge, with whom Sarzo maintained a close friendship. From April of 87 to September 94, both Sarzo and Aldridge were members of White Snake before lead singer David Coverdale put the band in a indefinite in hiatus. In 2007, Sarzo joined Blue Oyster Cult. And as the band's bassist, who became the band's Keyboard, uh, he replaced Richie Costello, who became the keyboardist and guitarist. Initially, as a guest musician, before officially taking over the role, he remained with Blue Oyster Cult until 2012. In January of 2017, Rudy was inducted in the, heavy, in the Hall of Heavy Metal History for being the forefront of heavy metal bass. On an August 28, 2017, on the podcast, The Church of What's Happening Now, with Joey Diaz and Lee Shand, Rudy says he has been he is now confirmed to be the basis for the Guess Who. Now, I remember Quiet Riot's mental health album when that came out. That was the first quote-unquote heavy metal album ever to be number one. Um, you look at other bands he was with in the startups. Yeah, at the end of Blue Easter Cult and Guess Who, he kind of filled in. He was there when Ozzy started. He was on White Snake was peaking. He peaked with Quiet Riot. Everyone, and I've heard other interviews he's done. Every time he's left a band, he's finished the tour first. He's never just left them hanging. So that's where you got to respect a guy like him too. You don't see that very often. Um, X, he's, and here's some other names he's been with. Uh, he's been associated with Quiet Riot, Angel, Ozzy Osbourne, White Snake, uh, Jeff Tate's band, um, Ingvay Malmsteen, Ingvay Malmsteen's Rising Force, Dio, Blue Oyster Cult, Double City Angels, the D-Metal Stars. I mean, he's just been on so many different bands. He's been on discography. He's been on White Snake albums. Ozzy Shout the Devil in his tribute. Um, Mars, which was the, the band he started, White Snake. He was on Slip of the Tongue and Live in Donington, uh, 89 and 2011 releases. Um, Manic Eden, he was with them. 
Uh, Dio's Holy Diver Live in 2006. He's on that one. Um, he's just uh, Jeff Tate from Queen's Right when he did went solo. He was on that one. Guess who? The future of what used to be in 2018. He's on that album. Just Rudy Sarzo is just such an all around class guy. Um, he's very. I've, I've, we're friends on Facebook, him and I. Um, <laughs> follow on Instagram. He's big into the pet rescue stuff. He's good in his music. He's just a decent guy, and you don't see that very often. I mean, how often do you hear guys saying, this guy's got too many drinking problems and drug problems. I'm out of here. This guy's too much of a big mouth. I'm out of here. Quiet Riot was on top. You were with Ozzy Osbourne, and you still left. So obviously – he has some morals. You got to like that too and respect that. So that's why I've always respected Rudy Sarzo. Um, you know, I said he was an artist of the week. I didn't, I didn't know what to call it. So I was going to put him in our, our ring of fame or whatever else. We'll just call it artist of the week, member of the week. We'll, 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 we'll come some classy name later. But whatever we call it, he is the inaugural member of it. Congratulations, Rudy. Maybe uh, you call like the featured artist of the week or something. Spotlight. Yes. Spotlight, spotlight character. Yes, yeah, so we'll come up with something classy. If you think of something, let us know on the Facebook page what you want us to call this a little bit. Something besides birthday and history. I don't know what you want to call it. Speaking of music, sir, you got to follow up that Alanis Morissette from last week. What do you got this week? I'm Let's go to the, the other side of the spectrum. I'm doing, the, I'm doing the swing, the full swing to the other side here. Uh, I'm going to start off with uh, a little mega death here in 1986. Peace sells, but who's buying? And so this, really, the review of this, it's their second studio album by American heavy metal band Megadeth. Uh, re released September 19th, Capitol Records, 1986. 36 minutes long, considered thrash metal. And uh, then he says, you, if you have the appetite for this, you'll like it. But uh, it says um, it's one of the es essential thrash metal albums. And one of the 1,001 uh, albums you must hear before you die. And so it's good stuff. Uh, uh, the recording of the album was difficult for the band because the ongoing drug issues the members had at the time. The drummer named Gar Samuelson, great name, and guitarist Chris Poland were fired shortly after the album's promotional tour for drug abuse. Uh, the title track was noted for its political conscious lyrics, was released as the album's lead single. The album's cover art, done by Ed Repka, uh, the cover art featuring the band's mascot, Vic Rattlehead. Vic Rattlehead is the mascot. Uh, uh, it shows him standing in front of a desolated United Nations headquarters and talks about the, the political money and whatnot. Now, the name, the album, I don't know if you know this, Andy, it came from Dave Mustaine, the lead singer, said he got this from a Reader's Digest article. The title of the article said, Peace Would Sell, But No One Would Buy It. He saw that and he says, I'm going to make an album um, for that, uh, with that, with that name. Now, New Stain and their bassist, Dave Ellefson, we'll get to him later, uh, stated that they wanted to change the public perception of heavy metal by writing songs that were containing socially aware lyrics rather than just lyrics for the heck of it. So, uh, Mustaine has a bunch of his political beliefs in the, in the songs and and whatnot so it's 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 very interesting but the label at the time combat records gave them a budget of twenty five thousand dollars to create the album now they hired freelance producer randy burns to produce it. it turned out to be very difficult for the band band because dave mustaine the lead singer and ellipson were both homeless at the time Furthermore, Chris Poland and Gar Dam Damilson would not show up for hours because of their heroin addiction for the drummer and, and bassist. So they had some real issues, but it turned out to be well. The album's artwork uh, would go, uh, was done by Ed Repka. He would go on to do several 
other pieces of work for the band. The cover art depicts the band's mascot in front of the ruined United Nations building. He is portrayed as a real estate agent who is selling the devastated remains of the organization's headquarters. Repka does consider the art to be a major significant milestone in his career. Megadeth toured with Motorhead and Alice Cooper um, at the time. Now, here's the tracks. Track one, Wake Up Dead. For those who have not heard the lyrics or read the lyrics, it it's, describes a man who's been cheating on his wife and then sneaks into the house the next morning drunk and he does not want his wife uh, to find out about his other lover because if she found that, he would wake up dead. Now, Dave Mustaine says that he was actually dating a girl and cheating on a girl, and he thought that she had intentions to kill him, so the lyrics are actually true. <laughs> Ripped from that lines. Right, right. He stayed with her because he was homeless at the time, and he was dating this psycho woman that was providing him a place to stay. This was early on in their career, and he said, that sounds good. I'll stay with her, but I actually have someone I'd like on the outside that's my real girlfriend, but if she woke up, uh, if she ever found out, I would wake up dead. So the song, very interesting lyrics. Song two is called The Conjuring. Uh, really talks about a, a satanic ceremony, makes references to the devil and that kind of thing. Now, since Mustaine converted to Christianity after this, <laughs> It was awkward, and, he, and they ended up not playing this song live after this um, at all. And it took, I think, a 17-year absence before they played the song The Conjuring, which was actually very good musically. But he said, I got I to gotta stay away from that. The next song is Peace Sells. talks about his political uh, beliefs, of course. Now, this song became the title track for MTV's main, uh, basically mainstay in the opening bass line by Dave Ellison local Minnesota guy, that opening bass line was used as an introduction to T MTV News. Yes. Intro to that. That bass line to that song we became the intro. Now, many people said, you must have made some good money on the royalties there. Well, they said, we're going to start charging you, MTV, royalties to play that song. And they set a date. And when the date came, MTV says, ah, we'll go with another intro song. They never got the royalties at all. They, they pulled it before, before the contract <laughs> took effect. Now, the last song on side A was Devil's Island, uh, which is a reference to a, a former French penal colony off the coach, off the coast of French Guyana, actual place. In yep. fact, just last week I saw this on an episode of Smithsonian or something, abandoned, strange abandoned uh, locations on cable, cable TV. This place was on there. It's an old place, kind of like a, what do you call the San Francisco uh, Alcatraz? It's an yep. island near the shore that people could not swim to or from, but they put all the, the, uh, the hardcore criminals out there and they called it Devil's Island. A lot of stuff going back there. Uh, and, and so that's a, that's, that location is, is a real place. The next tracks are Good Morning Black Friday. Two piece song starts with an instrumental. And then it's got some other uh, gory language and violent imagery. We'll leave it at that. Well, he's not talking about the shopping day after Thanksgiving, then. We're not talking about shopping or the no. day after Thanksgiving okay. at all. Black Good morning, Friday. Friday, not that. Okay. Good morning. Kind of, uh, the song chronicles the acts of a serial killer. So oh! That's, that's no, what it gets not, into. Not the same. Now, at the time, they said that the band was hanging, some guys with the band were hanging out, some people that were actually practicing the occult. And so a lot of these songs got, the lyrics got into the, into the music. We laugh about it now, but this was some hardcore stuff. And he inspired them to write the songs uh, based on more spiritual themes later on. Now, the next song is called Bad Omen. This explores themes of occultism as well. Now, they said, were you actually believing in this stuff, you and the band members? And Mustaine says that we were aware of the subjects that we wrote about. We didn't condone them or agree with them, but we wrote about things. Uh, we were aware of these various subjects. The next song is called I Ain't Superstitious. Now this was a cover song from Howlin' Wolf in 1961. Willie Dixon wrote this song, I Ain't Superstition, uh, Superstitious. 
Uh, it's a different version than the cover, the actual song we're familiar with, but uh, done in a good way, done in a Megadeth way. Last song on the, on the track, last, last track is My Last Words. And of course, this is a, talking about a game of Russian roulette and the fear that goes through your mind when playing the game. So it's very interesting. Now, the, the music, which I like uh, here, whether or not you like the lyrics, the songs, or what the lyrics are about, My Last Words is actually very good. Lars Ulrich, former Metallica and bandmate of Mustaine before he broke off, says that that was his favorite Megadeth song of all time was My Last Words. That's what Lars Ulrich. Ulrich. Megadeth is a lot like some of Prince's early stuff. The music's great. I could do without the lyrics. It's into some heavy stuff. Now, it changes. I'll get to the, the changing part here in a minute, but it was really, this album was a milestone recorded, regarded as a milestone in American thrash metal movement, along with Metallica's Master of Puppets and Slayer's Rain in Blood. All those three were out around the same time. Uh, considered pivotal in giving prominence to extreme metal. Very classic. This, this album is a classic and mandatory recording for fans of this genre. It's a mandatory. Also really helped the, the, uh, it, it went mainstream because of the uh, leading acts in the underground scene. It really it lifted it up. And basically the album was, uh, was flipping the bird to all the critics who were hostile to this type of music. Uh, they did get some uh, bad reviews, I guess. A lot of people said, no, you're really, yeah, you're, you're, you're really appealing to dead end kids in life without uh, possibility of the future. And then they actually developed a strong cult following inadvertently by putting these types of songs and music out there. So they switched all that, of course, and became really good. But uh, this was a good, a, a good album to feature. In fact, the liner notes of the CD were written between Dave Mustaine and Metallica drummer Lars Ulrich. They, they combined forces and wrote the liner notes for the reissue uh, for the 25th anniversary of the album. So I read off the tracks. Here's the personnel. Dave Mustaine, lead vocal. Chris Poland, guitars former heroin addict, uh, straight now, still around. Uh, drummer was Gar Samuelson. Now, Gar Samuelson died in 1999 in Orange County. He died at the age of 41, also heroin addict. And then Dave Ellison, bass. Now, the interesting thing here, we try to bring in the connection with the local. Dave Ellison was born November 12th, just uh, had a birthday, 1980, 1964 in Jackson, Jackson, Minnesota. My dentist, uh, Andy, is from Jackson, Minnesota. I'm going to ask him next time I go in yes. if he knows Mr. Dave Allison. He was an accomplished bassist very early and honed his skills at local clubs and then left and relocated to Los Angeles uh, when he was, after he graduated high school at age 16. Very good. Now, Allison like his bandmate Dave Mustaine, is a committed Christian. Uh, he was brought up in a Christian uh, background uh, and actually went to church and then sort of returned to it now in a 2010 interview. He does a weekly podcast called The Full Armor of God Broadcasting. Talks uh, uh, explaining that I found that you, just when you suit up and show up and walk your talk instead of talking your talk all the time, it's also, also often the best testimony. He's a very committed Christian, and he has children, does go to church, <coughs> and is uh, very, very uh, Christian. In fact, when this article was out, Elfson recently began studying for the ministry at the Lutheran Church Missouri Synod in Concordia Seminary in St. Louis. This is Dave Elfson. We go yep. back to those, those lyrics and everything we talked about earlier. He wasn't part of that, but boy, this band, when they started off, was on the edge of a lot of this. Um, they asked him, do you see any conflict being the basis for a secular metal band uh, being a Christian? Ellison said in an interview with the Christian Post, some people in the church may see an issue with me playing mainstream music, but this is the life I was given and my musical talents are also a gift from God. 
in hindsight, the formation and success of Megadeth is blessed by God. He said, for me to have a hunch at age 16, drive to California after my high school graduation, end up meeting Dave Mustaine at age 18, form this group was no random accident, he says. To me, the whole thing has had the Lord's hands in it from day one. After all, uh, after all, Christian plumbers, mechanics, lawyers, and doctors don't only work for the church. So why should a professional musician? That's Dave Ellison from Jackson, Minnesota, Andy, and bassist uh, for and co-founder of Megadeth. Any questions or comments on that one? You know, I'm just going to have to do a little looking on that. Uh, that name kind of rings a bell. You said the LCMS church and everything else. Like, hmm, got to look into that. But going back to the song titles there, I remember listening to Pete Sells, Who's Buying. Very good one. That first, you know, you, you, you mentioned that first song, that's why he had the crazy girlfriend he lived with, but he really had to like the other girl. Now, not to pick sides, but we've all had that crazy girlfriend. <laughs> but we know where he's coming from on that one. So, Wake up and, dead. And, 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 yeah, and really all those songs, Okay, yeah, they were bad, but it had to have happened to somebody where they wrote the song. He didn't just make this stuff up. But then again, it just shows the, for lack of better words, musical genius he had that, okay, yeah, but this is going to do, do a different group. But you know what? That group has money too. I'm not going to battle with Slayer and Metallica and their fan base. Let me find some little different genre. Same genre, but a little different. So to a point, did Dave know what he was doing all along by writing those goofy lyrics like that to try to get away from being lost in the shuffle with everybody else? Or was he just really that off-center and that's what he felt at the time? I don't know. From what I've read of Dave Mustaine, I could almost think he knew what he was doing. It was a little off-center to get off-center, you know. But great to hear about the other guys. Um, so like the drummer, the guy from Minnesota, though, he really never was into the hair when he said, though. He was always just kind of the other guy all the time, right? Yeah. So he was probably at the time, I'm in a band. It's a paycheck right now. I'm just playing my drums or the bass. I'm just playing the bass. Bass, yeah. They'll do what they got to do. So I have to check clears every week. I'm okay. Was that his attitude at the time? Because I know like with Striper. Oz Fox, who's having health issues right now, Striper. He's played in other metal bands. But that was out of love with the music. You know, does, just because you play with a... It's not a crime. It's not guilt by association where you're labeled your whole life like that. Musicians play where they got to play to get money sometimes or get their name out there. I don't begrudge him for what he did in the past. Here's uh, three, three last comments that I'm going to bring up. Uh, and the review says... It's a, a, it's, the album is an array of impressive tracks. One says, it's not, it's not for the weak hearted, <laughs> weak hearted this album. Yes. And Mike, Mike Stagno actually named the album a bona fide masterpiece and said this was the, one of the re main reasons Megadeth became one of the leading acts in the underground scene. So he called it a bona fide masterpiece and the music is good. And once I, I listened to the tracks again uh, for Dave Ellison's tracks and, and the bass. He's got some good bass work in this. It, you know, that one, a couple of the songs with the solos or the introductory on there is very, very good. Yes. Um, That's all I've got for the album of the week. So all I got, um, next week we would normally have our prep bowl special. We won't have that, but we'll have something special for you next week about the finals of how high school football turned out in their, uh, Rankings and seedings. We'll compare them between Max Prep Sports and the Star Tribune. See who's who's got who where. We've got the uh, – it'll be the Thanksgiving show next weekend as well. Yes. Uh, the Black Friday show. Uh, yes. Not, not the Megadeth version. Not the Megadeth yeah. song. No. You know, the thing I last uh, – Dave Ellison wrote an autobiography. Dave Ellison from Jackson, Minnesota, the basis for Megadeth. His autobiography is called My Life in Death, D-E-T-H. For Megadeth, my life oh. in death. That's his biography. If you look that up, forgot to mention that earlier. But a uh, good, interesting guy. Uh, put, a, put a link to that on the Facebook page. We will. I should put a link to that on the Facebook page. But uh, but but good good songs there. 
Any other uh, requests, please leave them below on the comments section or comments, requests, ideas, or suggestions. Watch this week on our social media pages for some big announcements, um, links to the wrestling podcast that I've been doing. Uh, we'll have a link for that out. We'll do that Monday. We don't want to bombard the site with it. So Monday, look for that. And Tuesday, we'll re release the link to our Spotify channel. Now, yes, you may be listening to the podcast on Spotify, but Dan's album of the week. Uh, we've taken a song off each album and put on a playlist on Spotify. And we'll release that on Tuesday for you. So you just listen to all the different, you know, different songs on there, a song from each album. Um, it'll be updated about once a month. So we don't have anything from Alanis Morissette last week or this week's album. But once a month, we'll add some new songs on there. And if we want to add a second song from an album, we might. If uh, you go, hey, you did this album. You did throw that song on there. Let us know. We'll put it out there. Perfect. Also, this next weekend's Thanksgiving show will be our 50th episode. Woohoo! Celebration. All right. Thanks, everyone, for listening. Have a good week. All right. Talk to you later. Bye.